Ladies and gentlemen, friends and fellow travellers, distinguished guests, welcome today to the Royal Geographical Society for this year's Architecture Conversations, where we celebrate the 16th Serpentine Pavilion designed by Bjarke Ingels uh, and his group, Big, as well as the four summer houses that sit alongside Queen Caroline's Temple in Kensington Gardens. To mark this significant occasion, the Serpentine's history of commissioning architecture, we are joined here today by Bjarke Ingels, the designer uh, of the pavilion. Uh, on the panel here, uh, Vicky Richardson, hans Ulrich Obris, artistic director of the Serpentine. And in the audience, uh, Kunle Adeyemi, NLE, Barco Liebinger, Jona Friedman, and Asif Khan. Vicky will moderate the first part of the discussion with Biake uh, when we will explore the pavilion. Uh, there will be then a short break before we continue with the architects of the summer houses. This year's spectacular pavilion is the 16th commission in the Serpentine Gallery's ongoing program of temporary structures designed by internationally renowned architects who at the time of their invitation have not completed a building in England. Attracting up to 300,000 visitors annually, this long-standing commission uh, has been to introduce audiences to the work of an international architect who have not completed a building at the time of the gallery's invitation. This is a moment to remember our friend and first ever pavilion architect uh, and also trustee of the Serpentine Gallery, the late Zaha Hadid, who once said, I think there should be no end to experimentation. To this day, her words are still with us and they drive what is embedded in our annual program. Our brief to ourselves, Hans Ulrich, mine and the team has always been to think the unthinkable. Following Zaha's extraordinary structure, the Pavilion Commission has grown from strength to strength to incorporate today a further project of four summer houses. We are not only thrilled, but also extremely grateful to the architects who have joined us over the last 16 years in designing stellar structures for presentation on our lawn and now outside the confines of the lawn. The pavilion architects we have commissioned to date have been last year, Salgas Kano, Smilian Radic in 2014, Sufujimoto the year before, Herzog de Muren and Ai Weiwei in 2012, Peter Zumptor, 2011, in 2010, Jean Nouvelle, Kazuo Sijima and Rui Nishizawa Osana in 2009, Frank Geary, 2008, 20, 2007, Olafur Eliasson and Kirk Torsen, Lilas, an installation by Zaha Hadid in 2007, a, um, a, an extraordinary building structure by Rem Kuhas and Cecil Thurmond with Arab in 2006, Alvaro Caesar and Eduardo Soto de Mora in 2005, MVRDV, Unrealized in 2004, that came the year before uh, the work by Oscar Niemeyer in 2003, Toyo Ito and Cecil Baumann, Arab in 2002, Daniel Leavskind with Arab in 2001, and of course, Zaha in 2000. As a unique commission in architecture, the pavilion's temporality can provoke architects into experimentation. Our curatorial approach to commissioning architecture is the same as it is working with artists, collaborating and encouraging them to realize their vision. This year's uh, Pavilion by Bjarke Ingels group embodies this approach, its design reverting back to one of the most basic elements of architecture, the brick wall. Rather than clay, stone, or stone bricks, the structure is erected by a composition of fiberglass frames stacked one upon another. By pulling the wall apart, it turns line into surface that can be explored in a number of different ways. The design is supremely elegant and is both curvaceous and soaring, uh, humbling to all of us who stand in it. Bjarke Ingels founded the architectural practice Bjarke Ingels Group, also known as BIG, or actually here at the Royal Geo, IBG, which is a new <laughs> <laughs> adaption of their name, in 2005 which is led by Bjarke and 11 additional partners that operate within the fields of architecture, urbanism, interior design, landscape design, product design, research and development. Since 2009, 
Bjarke has won countless architectural competitions and awards, including most recently the AIA National Architecture Honor Award in 2015, AIA New York Urban Design Merit Award 2015, the RIBA Award European National Winner 2014, and Architecture A Plus Awards in 2014. But it is our great pleasure to have Bjarke on stage, and I would like to now hand over to Hansel. Thank you so much, Julia, and uh, hello, everybody. We are we're so delighted uh, to have this conversation today. Uh, very grateful to Vicky, of course, to, to be our moderator, and we'll hand over to Vicky in a nanosecond just after saying a few more thank yous. And of course, all our gratitude uh, goes to, to Bjarke and goes to um, all the architects who designed summer houses for us. We've known each other, actually, we thought it was 12 years, but yesterday one of your former colleagues at OMA corrected me and said it was 16 years ago that we met for the first time at uh, OMA when you started to work there, I think, on the Seattle um, uh, Library. And as uh, Rem Kohlhaas recently said, Bjarke is the first major architect who disconnected the profession completely from angst. He threw out the ballast and salt. So a very, very warm welcome to Bjarke Ingels. Um, as Julia said, you know, this year, um, uh, for the first time, the pavilion scheme, uh, the architecture scheme became a polyphony. Uh, we believe a lot in Bactinian polyphony, so we felt it would be wonderful to do an architectural polyphony in the park. And point of departure was the Queen Caroline's Temple, which uh, Julia, our team, and I for many, many years always passed by, you know, and then we would go basically, you know, during... Uh, uh, if we have a lunch break, which is rare, then you know, we sometimes walk in the park and marvel at this amazing structure. And we are thinking, you know, could one actually do something with it? Because, of course, Panofsky said, you know, the future is invented with fragments of the past. Could this be a trigger for something new? And it's, of course, very fascinating because uh, Queen Caroline did ask the artist William Kent to do dozens of such different structures. There was, as Vicky shows in her wonderful text in the catalogue, a very cosmopolitan spirit there, uh, which we maybe can discuss later. And, in a way, we thought it would be fascinating to actually um, develop a very diverse spectrum by inviting architects from different generations, from different geographies, to somehow develop their summer house for 2016. We are very delighted to have uh, Kunle Adeyemi here, who uh, is between Lagos and, and Holland, and uh, um, after having actually won a silver line in Venice, uh, um, has here for London, for his first work in London, developed uh, a inverse replica of the temple, uh, in a way a tribute to its robust form and material recomposed in a new sculptural object. A very warm welcome to Kunle Adeyemi. We also are very delighted to have uh, Barco Leibinger here, who, whose design is inspired uh, not only actually uh, by one of William Kent's work, but actually by a second summer house that was once located nearby on a man-made mountain constructed from the dredging of the long water, which are both now extinct. So in a way, their summer house actually is in a Hobbsbaumian way a protest against forgetting, because it remembers us of this structure which is no longer there. A very warm welcome to Barco Leibino. <laughs> Hungarian-born and French-based, Paris-based architect Jona Friedman has been a inspiration for us for many, many decades, uh, ever since we met about 25 years ago in, um, in Paris, fascinated by Jonas Ville Spatial, Julia and I and Sally Talent, our former head of programs, invited Jonas in 2006 to actually uh, develop a project here with a school with 2,000 students. Jonas did a participatory project. Um, and we are very, very delighted uh, to, for the first time, work with Jonas here with an architecture uh, where, on the one hand, he developed the structure for the park, but also shows us images of his visions of uh, the spatial city for the 21st, 22nd, 23rd century. A very, very warm welcome to Jonas Friedman. We are also very, very delighted to welcome uh, Asif Khan here, a uh, London-based architect whose summer house is inspired by the geographical history of Queen Caroline's Temple, which was positioned in a way that would allow it to catch sunlight from the Serpentine Lake. 
So its design takes a circular form whereby the circumference has been ampled to connect oneself with the nearby temple. It's a kind of a multi-sensory environment, but we will hear from all the architects in the second panel today about their summer houses. Uh, please give a very, very warm welcome to Asif Khan. And of course, our uh, wonderful moderator, Vicky Richardson, uh, whom Julia and I also have known ever since our first encounter at the Sir John Soane's Museum. And it's kind of wonderful. It's always great to have encounters at the Sir John Soane's Museum. Uh, and actually, many of these, you know, um, somehow vistas you have from the pavilions, of course, made us think about Sir John Soane's ideas of all, of multiplying uh, vistas. Uh, of course, ever since Vicky uh, has uh, done so many things, she became Director of Architecture, Design and Fashion at the British Council in 2010, um, is now focusing on writing new books, curating exhibitions. Over the past six years, she has led design projects around the world, touring exhibitions in China, Korea, Nigeria, India, Brazil, Indonesia, and Finland. She's Commissioner um, of the Home Economics Exhibition for the British Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2016. It's one of the great pavilions this year in Venice because um, we believe at the Serpentine that, um, and it's something Julia and I have always believed in, that architecture should not be shown through models, but that it should be an experience. And so that, of course, leads us to build pavilions and summer houses. But of course, as Peter Smithson always said, another possibility is to actually have one-to-one -one developments of homes, of interiors, where one can really experience them. And the uh, whole models of 21st century living, which you can see now in the, um, uh, in the British Pavilion, actually, in, in, um, in Venice, is a great example for that. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Vicky Richardson. Also, last but not least, of course, uh, there is also the park nights, because um, Rem Colas told us in 2006, you know, in a way, pavilions can be content machines, and of course they are, they've always been, ever since Julia started in 2000, the pavilion with Zaha, and so the park nights are this idea of site-specific live art, poetry, music, film, literature performances, where throughout the summer we will have um, Brian Bellot, Gami Enro, Jalal Wahid, Sandra Perry, uh, artists taking over the pavilion and develop their kind of Gesamtkunstwerk using the pavilion. There will be theater with the implicated theater, which is part of our ongoing, ever ongoing, uh, long durational atrial role project. There are going to be readings by legendary poets Fred Moulton and Eileen Miles. We, there will be choreographers taking over the pavilion, Silas Rino, as well as cause music. It's very important that the pavilion can be used as a musical instrument, and we're very, very curious to find out how Piakas uh, and Big's Pavilion will actually sound when the BBC Radio 3 late junction will make a sonic takeover. We are extremely, extremely grateful, of course, to our amazing Serpentine public programming team, who has not only made today's event possible, but who makes all the park nights possible. So a very big applause for Lucia Pietro Justi. A very big applause for Claude Agile. And a very big applause for Sarah Shattuck and the rest of the programming team of the Serpentine Galleries. And now I hand over back to Julia with more thank yous. So ladies and gentlemen, um, what you have all been privy to is the uh, Serpentine Gallery Clapathon, which is a way of acknowledging everybody. And the reason we do that is because Actually, everybody plays such an important part in this, from the sponsors, obviously primarily the architects, but there are great teams behind them, and it's a team effort. And I suppose there are two things really I want to say are kind of off script, but completely on script. One is that this is an exhibition of architecture, and after 15 years of commissioning an architect to design a pavilion for our lawn, we wanted to see what would happen if we extended the idea of an exhibition out of our lawn into the park. Now, obviously, that is, um, that's an experiment, and we're incredibly grateful to the pavilion, to, to the Summer House architects who've joined us in this experiment, who've designed extraordinary uh, structures. Um, but it is an idea of looking at our architecture, contemporary architecture, in a wide variety of different ways. And, uh, that is the purpose of today's discussion, is really to explore that. There are more thank yous, but I will be super quick. Um, 
the internal team, and I'm going to suggest we do one huge clap rather than do it one by one, uh, <laughs> precedent set by Hans Ulrich. Um, Julie Burnell, head of projects, who together with Ted Feetonby and Alan Doyle of Stage One have worked tirelessly to build the structure. The curator, Amira Gad, together with Joseph Constable, who at the second time team have done an extraordinary job. We're enormously grateful to the Lars Wintors Foundation, to Goldman Sachs, to West Corp, or sorry, to West Bank Corp, to the Danish Arts Foundation, to ACOM, who gave us invaluable support to Stage 1, AKT2, while Fiberline Composites, DP9, Dinson Grants, the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies and Fine Arts, Peroni, Site Engineering Surveys Limited, WEP, HSE, and Zumtobel. This year's Pavilion Cafe is operated by Harrods, and additional thanks to Northacre, as well as Gmunchen Architects, and all those who wish to remain anonymous. The park nights that Hans Ulrich referred to, which is a hugely important part of our programs, are supported by COS. The Council of the Serpentine Gallery make our work possible, and Arts Council England provide really important core funding. So very many thanks to the all. Now then, with Before great... We hand no! over to Vicky, we need one more thank you. No! One more thank you. I think I wanted to ask you all for a very big applause for Julia, because it's an amazing oh, yeah. invention, the pavilions. Oh, yeah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very much. Vicky. Thank you both. Um, yeah, thanks for this opportunity, because I think it is a great invention, this program. And one of the reasons is that it, it generates such a fantastic discussion about art and architecture and, and in, in this kind of unique environment. And so it's a particular pleasure to be able to um, start that discussion, as it were, with this event, with, with Bianca here, and also with you, the audience. And I hope that um, after a, f a, f a bit of discussion between us here, we'll be able to hand over to you for your questions, and we've got some microphones going around. So please be, prepare, be prepared to um, ask some questions. Um, but first of all, Bianca, I want to start um, with a very open question, really. I mean, this is the 16th pavilion, um, so many great architects have come before you. Um, how do you start with something like this when you're first approached? Uh, what's, what's the process and, the, uh, and the, the work that you do to get going? Um, I mean, obviously, we are, we are quite uh, well acquainted with the, the Serpentine pavilions, mm. and um, I've, I've been to maybe a, a good handful of them. Uh, in person, mm. so, so we actually sort of, uh, which is almost like how we always work, we started doing this sort of uh, pretty thorough precedence uh, study trying to look at uh, what, what had already been, uh, been tested uh, with the pavilions. Uh, we tried to sort of uh, dissect, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of the successful pavilions somehow take up maybe a, a, a material and try to sort of work with the attributes of that material or they, and I think also the, the successful pavilions, they somehow take an, uh, an aspect of that particular architect's work. And I think it is, it is kind of interesting because like, I think as an architect, and I think this is definitely true for, for us, um, we like to mine the, the architectural idea from specific uh, constraints or specific uh, opportunities uh, in the context or in the program, the city, the culture, the climate where we built. So that's why uh, the specifics of the site often overpowers mm. whatever sensibility or agenda we bring to the table. And in that sense, as an architect, you always have to be quite tactical or strategic mm. Uh, because there are, there, are, there are a certain set of ingredients that you can, um, you know, turn into either uh, chicken seed or chicken salad. Like that there is, uh, that, and, and you can say like in the context of the park, that's not the case. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, in, it's interesting that this is an opportunity for an architect to behave and think more like an artist, in a way. And I think this, this dilemma f that you refer to for an architect of responding to the site and the client, 
but also having a strong thread linking through your work, um, which we can so, see so wonderfully in Yona Friedman's um, work. You know, an idea that starts when you're a student and then and you just keep coming back to you until you're in your 90s. I mean, for you, is this a chance to explore a particular set of ideas that, that obsess you? Or, or was it, do you think it was more about what you happened to be working on at, at this particular time? I mean, I, I think, um, um, you know, like the, 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 the Serpentine uh, in general has blessed uh, all the architects with a very short uh, uh, commission yeah. time. Uh, and, and I think this time sort of exacerbated by the fact that the, the opening was moved to, mm. to June, and uh, early June instead of early July. So uh, we, we kind of decided quite quickly that we had to make some very quick uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and one, of the, one of the ways to, to be able to mobilize that quickly was that we actually reached out to certain collaborators that we're already working with, mm -hmm. uh, where, we, where we feel that there's like, there was maybe opportunities to, to explore. And I think one, one material, the material of the pavilion, this um, product by, uh, by Fiberline called Laylight, which is essentially, it's a so-called pultrusion of glass fiber. So it's basically pulling a lot of fish lines, if you like, or glass fibers through uh, a mold, uh, injecting resin, and then you get this incredibly strong, super light uh, material mm -hmm. that also has a lot of material attributes. It has beautiful texture, it's actually translucent. It also reflects the light when it's directly upon it, and it also makes it glow slightly mm -hmm. because the depth of the material, uh, light enters and makes it glow. So it has a lot of nice um, possibilities, and it hasn't really been explored, and it's, and it's one of these kind of uh, materials. It's, uh, it's essentially what, um, uh, windmills are made of. It's mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of materials that, that will define our future, or our present and our future, mm -hmm. uh, work with that material. So we thought, you know, like over Christmas I went uh, to their factories and walked around with the, uh, uh, the owner and just looked at this, the stuff they had on the mm -hmm. shelves. Where, where's the factory? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's like in the middle of, uh, of Denmark. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, so we, we basically walked around in the factory mm -hmm. and picked up stuff from the, from the shelves. And, you know, mm -hmm. what can you do with this? Like this bends, this mm -hmm. extrudes. Um, and then, um, then I think maybe one, one theme that sort of uh, goes through all our work, um, it sort of it finally crystallized to me uh, yesterday, is that people often ask us, what are we inspired by? And, uh, and I've always said that actually everyday life is already interesting enough. Uh, the practicalities of everyday life, resolving, resolving them in a way uh, that becomes either joyful or beautiful, um, recombining elements of the everyday in a way that creates new opportunities, mm -hmm. is already incredibly exciting. You don't have mm -hmm. to refer to uh, you know, the st uh, star constellations or uh, French philosophers necessarily. Everyday life itself is already a super interesting uh, mm. subject, and normally, like one way to explain what design and architecture is, is you can say it's it's practical pro poetry. It's turning, uh, it's resolving all the practicalities of everyday life in a poetical way. Mm. And, I mean, and one, I think one of the things I, I was wondering, looking at it again this morning, was um, as you walk around it, it changes. Uh, every, everybody's probably experienced this already, and I couldn't work out: is it a simple structure or is it a hugely complex one? Because from some angles, it just looks so straightforward, you know, just stacked up boxes. Uh, but it's also, I mean, uh, I, I suppose we, it's worth mentioning, obviously we're here rather than in the pavilion itself. And, uh, and as you'll probably know, it's, it's still a work in progress to some extent. It's so actually done it, now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the pavilion right. is done. Whoa, great. <laughs> <laughs> That's, um, but uh, you know, I must say, seeing it yesterday with a with a with a workman sitting on the on the ridge and the crane was fantastically exciting because I thought, you know, this is really what it's about, isn't it? Um, it it's a, it's about trying something that's quite challenging and making an experiment, um, and to see it actually being built, it, to, to my mind, enhanced the experience and made it more more dramatic. But tell us, I mean, you know, how difficult was this to achieve? Um, I mean, maybe two things. I mean, um, f first of all, the, the, the question whether it's simple or complex. Mm -hmm. um, I love the, in computer programming, they have a, a really beautiful definition of complexity, 
which is that complexity is the capacity to transmit the maximum amount of information with the minimum amount of data. So uh, essentially the fewer, the, the shorter a line of code you can write that will make the computer do what it needs to do, the, the more complex it is. So in that sense, complex is the opposite of complication. Mm. Complex is really condensing meaning or information into as, as few moves as possible. And I think what, what we've tried to do with the pavilion that I was getting to before this idea of practical poetry is actually to, to create the extraordinary, the extraordinary out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. to, uh, to take uh, a simple uh, frame, an, an extruded uh, fiberglass frame that's, that's self-similar, if not identical, it's the same extrusion, mm -hmm. it's just cut to different lengths, and then the way you put it together uh, creates all of the possibilities. The, the, the individual brick itself is nothing, but it's the way you put it together that mm -hmm. creates uh, everything. Um, so in that sense, um, like maybe that, that is essentially what, that's the power of design or the power of architecture. It's, it's the, um, that the entire impact is taking this, you know, with the same stack of bricks uh, or the same pile of mm -hmm. sand, you can either cr create one of the seven wonders of the world or mm. create a pile of junk. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, and I think that, that's what it really is. It's <clears throat> everything that that shelf is, is what we've uh, done to mm. it. Mm. it. It sounds very pragmatic, very practical. You know, you're driven by materials and um, structure and uh, I suppose a sort of process. But, but it has been compared to a sort of chapel, this, this structure. Um, and, you know, we know that it's a great opportunity for people to come together. I mean, in some ways you could say that um, art and, and temporary pavilions have become the new communal spaces, new, new spaces for people to come together for a meaningful experience in, in the way that churches might have been. How important is that kind of aspect to you? I mean, is, is, there, a, do, is, is there a kind of emotional or po poetic sort of... Um, message you want to get across, or do, where, where does that come into your work? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, obviously in the, in the sort of notion of practical poetry mm -hmm. that, that lies in it, it's, but, but, but in a way, the ingredients that we have to work with are, you know, everyday life, but, but you can sort of en enable or accommodate every la everyday life in so, in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And I think what we always try to do that's, that's why we are interested in, in things that have hybrid identities, you know, that you can see the pavilion as a gate uh, over to the, to the pavilion, uh, to the certain type of, uh, gallery. And as you, as you walk through the gate, you actually get this sort of nice uh, framed view of the gallery with the spire on top. It almost fits like a glove uh, mm -hmm. around the, the gallery. But you can also see it as a, as a room. You can see it as a structure you can inhabit on the outside. You can sit on the on the steps, but also, also it's, a, it's a cave inside. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's opaque in some directions, it's completely transparent in other directions. Mm -hmm. So it's bringing together these hybrid notions where there's, there's not necessarily one right way of doing it, but it, it opens up as many uh, possibilities as possible. And, and then I think there's one important point is that I think in general, we are, our approach is a little bit trying to put together an experiment with a set of ingredients, and then rather than willfully imposing, uh, you know, this is what we want to do, and then, then trying to find a way to build that. It's, it's not like uh, I or anyone sits down and makes a finished sketch, this is exactly the experience we want. Mm -hmm. It's more like we try to take a set of ingredients, and then we try to put them into play, and then we, uh, uh, observe, like in a way, rather than imposing, we are uh, interested in exploring. Mm. Um, rather than dictating, we're interested in discovering. I think that's, that's wonderful to hear, also because I had the pleasure of writing this essay about the uh, Queen Caroline Temple, and the way that William Kent approached the design of um, small pavilion structures was very much by thinking about the life then and the activity that would happen around it. He sketched people always, you know, using and passing through his, his buildings. The, 
people, whether actors on, on, on this sort of stage set. And I think your, your pavilion very much has that kind of quality. Um, I love the idea that, uh, you know, we, that it, it's inhabited and, and its meaning changes. I mean, I, w I was actually last night talking with um, a businessman who's in self-storage, and he commented that um, wouldn't it be fun to start using these boxes uh, <laughs> to actually, as a repository for um, objects, or, because it, it, it does immediately strike you, you know. Uh, Julia, yeah, what's your thought? I mean, one of the things that I would, um, your conversations are so penetrating, and I just want to make an observation uh, before we perhaps move on to Bjarke's other work, uh, which of course informs what he's done on the Serpentine Lawn. One of the things that's so fascinating about this project is its limitations as well as its possibilities. The limitations are very, very clear. It's one tiny piece of grass, which all of you may have seen. When the pavilion's not there, it's really, really small. So that's the first thing. Um, and what Biake and his team have done is create something of a really epic nature, of real grandeur uh, and real scale within this tiny footprint. And that's the thing that I think has really defined it beyond any other structure that we've had on the lawn. I really feel when I stand in there this soaring height. So it becomes a cathedral-like space. Now, all those kind of uh, references are, of course, appropriate, but it's not about making grand statements like that. It is actually about the reality of the pavilion. So for me, one of the most fascinating things is, is that that understanding of design that made Biake and his colleagues really hit that high note. And that high note, for me, is what defines the structure. And really, chapeau, because it's, it's an extraordinary achievement. And ladies and gentlemen, if I may, follow Hans Ulrich's lead, a round of applause for Biake. <laughs> It's also very interesting that, you know, Ricky, you mentioned the, the aspect of, the, you know, the church or the, mm. the cathedral, because I, I remember it had to kind of almost proust your memory uh, sort of flash yesterday, you know, when we were in the pavilion, actually, uh, it reminded me of that very first conversation we had at OMA when we met, not 12, but 16 years ago, um, when you actually talked about leverance, and, you know, then I, you know, wasn't at that time looking a lot at leverance, and I remember I ordered all the books afterwards and went to see buildings. So I kind of was thinking it would be maybe interesting if you tell us a little bit about inspirations, if leverance mm -hmm. is still an inspiration. We also talk quite a lot about Udzon in relation to this pavilion, and maybe there are others. Yes. I mean, I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about uh, leverance also in uh, Sigurd Leverance, the, the Swedish architect, uh, in the context of this sort of uh, almost like cathedral-esque uh, feeling you get inside the uh, uh, the pavilion is um, that uh, that he actually spent most of his life restoring uh, uh, Gothic churches, and then at some point he returned uh, to modernism. Uh, and I think in in his work, uh, he had a very sort of honest, uh, um, almost gear-like or tool-like way of putting a building together. Uh, so like he, he, he did these, he did like two churches and a small flower shop in a, in a graveyard. Uh, and, and that flower shop, for instance, like uh, he was the guy who came up with the idea to, to mount the, the window outside the, uh, the wall. So it's like fully articulated from the outside quite crudely, but from the inside you look out and all you see is a hole uh, in, in the wall, in the brick wall, almost like a, like a ruin, uh, like a windowless ruin. Um, uh, you know, he, he made in the flower shop. He made this like beautiful installation on the concrete wall, where he just took a series of um, of cables and uh, and sockets, and then they split up, so it almost looks like a vine crawling. Because he, he didn't want to like uh, he, he didn't install the, the cables inside the concrete. There was no budget for it. But then he, he turned uh, uh, the wiring in, into not a, a you know a hiccup, but actually like almost like an artful uh, uh, installation in a flower shop. So I think. That, that idea of making a virtue out of necessity, I think, is, is quite dear to us. And I think, I think maybe that's also the, the deliverance-esque element in, uh, in the pavilion is that because we, we wanted to really articulate that these boxes are sliding past each other and the, the way to accommodate it so that every second box goes to either side is with these like, almost like Miesian uh, aluminum profiles uh, uh, that are like pluses. But if I might say... And, and, and actually, I mean, just by... by, by a, yeah. 
by embracing that, it becomes part of the, the aesthetic, almost like the, when you look at a Swiss uh, clockwork, the, the most beautiful part of the watch is actually the, the mechanisms that makes it work. I agree with that, but I also think that, I mean, Leverance is, is beloved by architects today for, for really for his restraint and modesty, which, if I might say, is, is not something associated uh, with, with you. And one of the things I, I love about your work is that it, it, it has an element of the heroic about it, you know, and, and we've referred to this, this, the sort of soaring nature of the pavilion, and, and I think that is inspiring, um, and it seems, seems to me that, that, you know, much of the qualities of architecture that are celebrated right now are not the heroic um, qualities. We seem to have a bit of a problem with that. Um, what, what, what is it that, that seems to draw you to, to, to making to these grand flourishes, and I mean, that's a... There must be something inspiring you, or uh, you know, take, taking you you've, in this positive spirit. I think, which which is very much missing from a lot of architecture today. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's interesting. I mean, I think maybe that, that's where uh, Utsan um, that mm. Hans Ulrich mentioned is is an interesting character because he definitely learned a lot from uh, uh, from Levans. Uh, mm. He obviously learned a lot from uh, both Irosarin and and, uh, and Alba Alto. Um, but but he but he was interested in this uh, thing that he called the additive, um, mm. you know, like sort of he began his career like fifties uh, and sixties, uh, and he was fascinated by the power of uh, industrialization and um, mass production to uh, to make um, perfectly manufactured uh, elements, and he had the theory of the additive was that you could make. Any, uh, any sort of expressive sculptural form with a, 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 a small a handful of, uh, of identical or at least self-similar elements. Mm. And, uh, and, the, and the Sydney Opera, um, at least most of it, at, at least the entire exterior, is this sort of homage. It's like a very, very complex form. It's, like, uh, it's almost like the TWA terminal uh, uh, by Eros Arinen. Uh, but it, instead of being sort of uh, chicken wire and, uh, and sort of gunite spray on concrete, it's entirely prefabricated uh, uh, with tiles and prefabricated concrete elements, uh, which gives it, um, let's say, it's like sort of an almost like gothic tectonic that the that the TWA uh, mm -hmm. sort of doesn't really have to the full I mean, extent. You know, Utzon was very much uh, going against, uh, in a way, he, you know, he was challenging the, the spirit of his time as well. I mean, do you feel in your work that you are somehow challenging um, the status quo? I mean, that quote from Rem, that you, you, you've, uh, you've, you've made an architecture free from angst. Well, it, it seems to me that if you go to Venice Biennale anyway, it's, it's a Biennale full of angst, um, which, Leads to good discussion for sure, but I mean, it, it, what's, do you agree with Rem's statement? I mean, what do you think's um, behind it? Yeah, like so, as, as far as I know, like uh, isn't isn't Angst uh, actually a Kierkegaard? Uh, at least he talked a lot about it, uh, which is a Danish philosopher. Um, <laughs> You're so, avoiding uh, the question the, again. But I, no, but like, uh, no, but I, but I actually, like, you know, I actually think that I think maybe one thing that goes through everything we do, and I think maybe more blatantly. Than, uh, than maybe, um, let's say, the majority of the profession, we, uh, we do really uh, take human happiness very seriously. Mm. Uh, and, and of course, that's why I've, you know, pe people refer to, to our buildings as, uh, as being playful, et cetera. But, it, but in a way, what we're trying to do is to very carefully resolve all the things that a building uh, uh, needs to do, and then also to provide as many possibilities for unfolding human life as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that exploration is, of course, to constantly uh, monitor, like be, be open and attentive, have open eyes and open ears, and see how our world is slightly changing. Mm -hmm. And if you take a project like the one we're building in, uh, in Copenhagen right now, uh, um, called the um, uh, it's, it's, like, it's, it's like a, it's called Arc. It's, the, it's a power plant uh, that is so clean that you have zero toxins coming out of the chimney, which means that we can actually turn the entire roofscape of this gigantic, it's the tallest and biggest building in Copenhagen, into an alpine ski park. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually going to have pine trees, it's going to have hiking paths, uh, it's going to have 
you know, it's like a man-made Montmartre, like where you can o overlook the otherwise completely flat city of Copenhagen, uh, and you can alpine ski uh, for the first time in uh, uh, in Denmark. Uh, and and in in a way, it's it's it sounds like playful. Like so, sometimes people attribute irony to what we do, but that there is never any irony, because uh, I think to me, irony is almost like when you say something but you don't really mean it. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what we do is like we blatantly mean uh, what, we, uh, what we say. And I think maybe also then we go out and design buildings that do what we, we say. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think with, with that in mind, I think one of the roles of architecture, because I mean, I, I love studying architecture and I, and I think you become a better architect by, by, uh, by understanding what other architects have done before you. But the, the reason that we shouldn't just keep repeating like this epic Louis Kahn building or this epic uh, Jan Utzan building, is because the world is always changing. And it's, it's, we know, for instance, like clean technology suddenly means that we have to reconfigure people's preconceptions of what is a power plant. Normally it would be something that ha would have to be as far away as possible because you didn't want to like breathe the fumes. Mm -hmm. Now it can actually be uh, the bedrock mm -hmm. for a new playground. Mm -hmm. and, and I think in that sense, um, this idea of focusing on human, human happiness as, a, as an important enterprise uh, also allows you to deal with uh, you know, uh, housing challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it also allows you to deal with the environment, but it also allows you to, uh, without any guilt, uh, deal with how do we maximize human enjoyment? Mm -hmm. How do we uh, celebrate? Um, that's great, yeah. I, mean, I think that's a wonderful restatement re of, of humanism. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think it's it's great that you're you're doing that because we it's it's quite rare to, to to hear that sort of spirit. I think. I mean, one of the things about the Serpentine Pavilion is, of course, it has no functions to speak of. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no loo that you have to worry about in terms of design or kitchen. Well, there's a Harrods Cafe. Well, I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> the cafes are pro forma, and they're there for a reason, which is to encourage people to spend time in the structure which they might feel awkward about doing. It's not for income generation or any other considerations. It's about aiding people to absorb the idea of being in the structure. Um, but one of the things that is so particular about the Serpentine context is obviously the, the fact that it's a pastoral setting, albeit a man-made one, but the fact that during the summer it is a completely playful environment. People are promenading, people are playing, people are there enjoying the time in nature with their families or on their own or with their dogs. And they get to know that setting, or I think one of the most beautiful parks in the world, um, through being in it and being close to nature. And so it's very perhaps appropriate that given your sense of human happiness that you have designed a structure that is going to also give people another reason to, as it were, multitask while they're in the park, mm. as well as being with nature, as well as doing what they were there to do, walking or maybe something else. There is also a very, very important uh, process of, of not only absorbing your work, which they will do through looking at it and being inside it, but also understanding about contemporary architecture over a series of 16 years. And this year, of course, it's with the, with the summer houses. So it mm -hmm. is very interesting, this whole notion of celebration of architecture. And it's not the only, um, I mean, the extraordinary work that you've done in um, Sweden in terms of the housing project and how you've adapted that whole understanding of architecture is as a very mm. Denmark. Yes. Shall we? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we, for those of you who are Scandinavian, I apologize on reserve. We should, really, we should really know the difference after all these uh, Scandinois um, dramas, but let's yeah, but It's confusing because <laughs> Borg and uh, no, actually the bridge takes place in both Sweden yeah, and Denmark. Exactly my so point I, I, I totally understand. The spending time thing I think is interesting because you mentioned the idea of you know, spending time. And I was actually thinking yesterday we spoke um, with Asif about that as well, you know, because of the multi-sensory, you know, nature of, 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 of his summer house. But I think it's true for all, you know, the summer house and the pavilion. This, this is text by Margaret Mead, I think it's from 48, where she basically said, you know, the problem of the ritual of the exhibition is that it very much appeals to the visual sense. And 
only, no? And, and, and if it only appeals to the visual sense, it means that people spend only a few seconds, you know, to check it out, and then they move on. And she says, basically, rituals which appeal to more than just the visual sense make people stay longer. Um, and she then mentions, you know, Bali rituals, or she mentioned medieval masses. But obviously, that sort of idea of the multi, you know, when we visited, um, uh, which was one of the great experiences for me, actually, experiencing your work, when we visited your, your project with, uh, with Superflex, no? It's a very multi-sensory environment in terms of uh, experiencing, in terms of its tactile aspect, in terms of the sound, all, all of these elements. I was kind of wondering maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, sort of this multi-sensory dimension. Yeah, I mean, I think also like, um now that uh, Julia mentioned nature, I think one of the things, and, and of course when you, when you see the pavilion uh, uh, and, and uh, when you go there afterwards, it, it, has a, it, it creates a lot of moments that remind you of, uh, of, uh, of natural landscapes. And I, think, uh, and, and I love uh, spending my holidays in, uh, in more wild nature, and I think the reason for that is that when you're in a city, every, every surface is coated with... Um, uh, a, a set of appropriate behaviors and, and, uh, and a set of prohibitions. Uh, whereas when you're in nature, it's, a, it's more like uh, anything you can do, uh, you're welcome to do. Uh, and, and of course, in that sense, we've been quite fascinated by these. Um, uh, we participated in a, uh, in a film uh, a friend of ours did uh, that's called My Playground that looks at parkour. Uh, and th these uh, parkour guys, or, or free runners, have visited uh, some of our buildings, some of our uh, construction sites, the mountain in Copenhagen, that has uh, some, some aspects that uh, the pavilion also invokes, where they're like, literally jumping around on these 10-story like, uh, ten, ten buildings. And of course, they can do these things. <clears throat> it's against the law, but they can also only do it because they're incredibly good uh, athletes uh, and acrobats. Uh, and I think in a lot of our work, we actually try to make maybe less uh, fit uh, and, and law-breaking people uh, able to, to do things that you're normally not invited to do in the, in, the, in the city. And of course, the pavilion is designed so you can, you can literally climb it uh, all the way up. Uh, Royal Parks uh, set a limit uh, uh, around uh, two or three meters. Uh, and, and I think that's still quite, quite an exciting thing to, uh, to, to do in a building. But I think this, that, it's not like there's a stair here, it's not like there's a sidewalk here, it's not like there's a bench here. There's a, a, a lot of invitation to, um, to explore the, uh, the, the building in different I ways. I think that's a great point to see whether there's any questions. Um, can we have the lights up a little bit so, so I can see who, who's putting their hand up? And um, are there the microphones? Uh, so put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. I might, I might take um, two or three, if there are more, just so we can get more questions in. I can only see one at the moment. Uh, right, here. Go ahead, please. Yes, yeah, so this is, this is actually Frank Barco from Barco Leibinger. Um, could we have a microphone at the front, please? Project, right. I'll talk at you. <laughs> I mean, I think it's totally right in terms of setting up the project. And I think there's, uh, first, you need to find a kind of typology that, that, that is new in contrast to the other 16 pavilions. And then uh, the second idea of working quickly, you know, bringing something to the site, uh, a technique, a way of doing things. And then uh, thirdly, I think the idea of, um, you know, responding somehow, what makes it site specific, what makes it work um, in this particular scale. Um, but I was wondering, I mean, um, you know, yeah, I, I so was, uh, sorry, thanks. You know, going, uh, reading the papers today, you know, and the idea of, um, you know, one, and, and it was mostly positive, but one of the, one of the pushback was, uh, you know, the idea of the one-liner, right? Which, so the idea of something being extremely legible at the expense of maybe complexity, right? And, and this is something that we all said, you know, that a pavilion could do. But, but when I think of uh, examples like Utzen or Leverance, I mean, these are architects that really are about complexity and about layering and many, many, many different readings through an architecture. So I guess my question would be, if these are experiments that are going to take us somewhere else, um, is that a good place to go? Or as, uh, you know, at the end, what is the concurrency of a project like this? Is it something, you know, we, we've done and we can go to the next project? Or again, what, 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 what would that mean for the next project in a sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, maybe uh, leave the microphone, please. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to sort of. Yeah, so, so the, the question is, what, what did we learn from this? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. But maybe I'll, I'll pick up on the, on the one line, because I actually think that there is, uh, um, you know, Jan Utsan was an incredible communicator. Uh, and uh, if any architect could ever deliver crystal clarity with, like, very, very uh, few words, it was, uh, it was Jan Utsan. Um, at the same time, I think his, his, his work is like a, a, a incredibly wonderful, and, and I think uh, he, sadly he didn't build that much. Um, but uh, I, I think the strength of his work is actually that it is crystal clear. Like there's like Kai Fiske, uh, a great sort of critical uh, regionalist, uh, modernist architect in Denmark. Um, he ought to say that, uh, you know, a design idea has to be so clear that you can piss it in the snow, uh, which is something you can do in Denmark. Uh, and, um, Montana and, 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 I, and I think in that sense, I think I, I find it interesting, you know, if you take sort of Albert Einstein, his ability to distill um, meaning and, and complexity into incredibly condensed formats, uh, you know, uh, Nietzsche's, uh, you know, use of aphorisms to condense meaning into um, uh, very, very uh, sort of condensified uh, sentences. Um, that, that I think it's interesting in architecture that there's a suspicion for the ability to express what you're doing as a flaw. Because to me, it is only a strength. And I think that's what enables, because architecture is not, at least for me, it, it is a, con a collective uh, endeavor. It requires the coordinated collaboration mm -hmm. of countless uh, forms of, uh, of intelligence and countless professions to make it uh, sort of become something in concert. And if you are not able to transmit what it is you're doing in, in a way even, even past the source code of what you're trying to achieve to the other collaborators, uh, you will only have minions or executive morons, but the second that you mobilize the intelligence and effort of the entire team, then you can really strive towards something. So, so therefore, I think, um, I think there's something dangerous in that, uh, that discourse that just because you know what you're doing, uh, it, 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 just because you are able to actually communicate what you're doing, uh, then, you know, then, then it might not be... Uh, um, uh, that that you know that difficult, whereas if you are completely unable to express it, ooh, then it must be uh, wow. Mm -hmm. you, like, you can't even explain it. Then then it must be uh, incredible. So so that I think there's something. Uh, it's like almost like crypto fascism that you know mm -hmm. by uh, by making no sense, uh, everybody's sort of uh, unable to engage in a meaningful dialogue. Mm -hmm. Can um, we see if there are any other? Put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. Right, there's a, a guy with glasses, black T-shirt there. Sorry, I'm just trying to get some more comments and questions in. It'd be interesting to hear what you all think about this discussion. Um, your comments uh, on the need to be aware of and understand uh, um, what's going around, around you as regards to the world constantly changing, you just need to keep up with it, and making sure your designs are relevant. That reminded me, um, not sure how much of an issue it is in Europe, but in this country we have a really, really horrific housing crisis. And I, th I think you should speak up a little bit. Sorry. Uh, um, that better? Yes. So that um, the housing crisis. Yeah, because your comment regarding you know, designers having to adapt and people having to adapt constantly to the world changing around them. Um, I was wondering, with respect to you know, housing in this country, which certainly in my opinion doesn't seem to be fit for purpose, it's too expensive, it takes too long to build, and it's not adaptable. Um, it's still very much brick and mortar, um, mother, father, two and a half children. Um, that's what it's designed for. And you now one of the main responses the government has is to go back to the whole Garden City initiative, which is low density development, which itself causes problems and it wouldn't... That, can we stick to the yeah. housing question rather than discussing cities yeah. as well? Let's, let's 
Is but I didn't question? capture. I didn't capture the question. Actually, what was the question? In, Apologies. In two seconds. What? How would you go about redesigning the house for it to be you know, cheaper, modular, and adaptable? Great. Excellent. I mean, yeah, because I mean, of course, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of aspects that are simply beyond uh, design, and I think maybe one of the things that made this year's Biennale. Um, sort of maybe less impactful than it could have been is that there's not always, a, like a lot of problems, there's a, there's a more impactful solution than a design solution. Uh, but um, one design solution that we're actually working uh, with is um, we have co-founded a company called Urban Rigger where we're using... Um, uh, the, the container industry, the fact that uh, in, in Eastern Europe you actually have a declining uh, sh shipping industry and uh, we found that the beautiful thing about the, the regulations at sea is that they are much more international because the seas are connected, whereas building regulations are incredibly specific uh, to each city. The sea regulations are, are, are much more uh, universal. So we can actually do a 300 square meter structure, maximum seven meters of height. That's two high, high top or high cube containers stacked on top of each other. Uh, um, to make uh, um, uh, 14 uh, homes for students floating on a barge uh, in this kind of rather beautiful little configuration around a uh, central courtyard. It's very and metabolist. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's totally a metabolist. And it has like a, totally this sort of Jona Friedman-esque uh, aesthetic. <laughs> uh, but, um, but, but what we're able to do is actually to deliver uh, a nice student home on the waterfront uh, and in most European cities, especially in Copenhagen where we're starting and in Gothenburg, which is where the first big project is going to be uh, of uh, 400 units, um, you can actually jump out of your window into clean water. Uh, so, uh, so these students for uh, what would be in pounds, uh, around uh, 500 pounds uh, uh, a month, will get this, uh, this awesome a waterfront, uh, uh, you know, uh, apartment with a roof terrace, uh, th uh, using the, the thermal um, storage of the of the sea to uh, to heat and, uh, and cool the homes, uh, solar heaters uh, uh, on the roof, uh, and a and a sort of Tesla uh, battery station in the in the basement. So so there we're at least just trying to hack, let's say, a, a declining industry which is shipping uh, and the sort of transportability of. Uh, uh, of the containers. I think in the second, the second unit, what we're going to do is we're actually going to um, have all of the inventory packed into containers that we then ship from China to the shipyard in, in Poland. There they, uh, they, they do the welding, install the windows, stack them as units, and then from there you're going to drag them to, uh, to, uh, to, Go to Gothenburg. The first one is arriving in Copenhagen in, uh, in two months. And this is actually uh, an entirely for-profit uh, company, but we're just out, um, out delivering compared to a conventionally built uh, sort of a student housing uh, built on land with conventional contractors because we can actually uh, do it off-site. Uh, um, and, and, and we're having a quite positive dialogue with a lot of cities because a lot of cities are experiencing that their students, uh, like in London, are having a hard time affording the, the rent, and this is a way to sort of s secure uh, homes to the students you want to attract to your universities. Mm. And it's also a topic, Vicky, of the, of the pavilion, you of course. Yeah, commission. yeah. I mean, it's very home. urgent you see yeah. the British pavilion <laughs> in Venice, because that's yeah. addressing that. Yeah, in yeah. The yeah. I actually had an interesting, frustrating experience in the pavilion, because like, I was like desperately <laughs> looking for uh, a bathroom, and you walk through this pavilion <laughs> that's full of toilets, but none of them are plugged in. <laughs> that's so right. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, there's one in the basement, a real one. But um, before we we have a, a quick break, um, I just wanted to sort of bring one question back to to the three of you, really, which is picking up on something Frank said about the one-liner, and actually. Um, I think the, the, the problem with the one-liner is probably more a, a problem of the language and the, and the discussion that we have about architecture rather than a problem of the architecture itself. Um, I mean, just looking at some of the reviews of, of um, uh, Bjarke's Pavilion, uh, it, it strikes me how, how much we tend to refer to architecture by comparing it with something else. So, um, funnily enough, here we are in the Royal Geographical Society, but lots of the reviews describe the 
pavilion as a, an iceberg or a, gla a glacier. Um, and, uh, you know, these, these kind of, it, it's almost as if we're struggling to find a language to actually describe what this, this means. And, and I wondered what you think about this, Julia Hansen. Well, yeah. If I may, I'll answer this. I mean, one of the things that's very fascinating about the pavilion is this idea of ownership. Ownership by the public, and that's why we do it. We're a not-for-profit institution that presents contemporary art, architecture, and design to the public. And that anthropomorphizing of the pavilion kind of makes it personal. You know, it, the, the um, Smilian Radic was a donut. Mm. They each have, uh, Sue was the cloud. They each have the kind of friendly form. So the, it also goes, um, the shard, I can't remember what that was called. But so new, there is a convention or there is a tradition now um, that buildings are kind of named as a way of characterizing them, making them more friendly, more human, more approachable, less about contemporary architecture that still people find as an idea, only as an idea, somewhat forbidding. Yeah. So I don't mind that as a principle. What is the most important thing to me is that people come and they spend time in it and then they discuss it. And they discuss it in a wide variety of different ways. Hans Ulrich has this incredible story about a taxi driver whose child uh, drags them to the pavilion, and then they talk about architecture from that point onwards. So the communication thing that Biarque was referring to takes so many different forms, and in the end, it kind of doesn't matter. Yeah. What is important is that people have the possibility to experience. And the experience, of course, is Biarque's extraordinary structure on the lawn, but it's also this year uh, summer houses, which are more manageable in size, particularly because of our brief. So that is my answer to that. Yeah. I mean, it's like, for me, no worries. Yeah. Also, I think there's also, um, maybe again, uh, back to this aspect that, to me, it's, it's almost, you know, like, in sort of Darwinian words, like from the simplest beginning, um, all of the wonder uh, of the world, of the, of the biosphere, has evolved. Uh, but it's essentially like a few uh, uh, carbon uh, um, molecules organized in, in increasingly uh, exciting ways. Um, and, and I think to me, like I am actually quite interested in this idea of finding that very, very simple, clear point of departure, but that then actually unfolds a whole world of, uh, of possibilities and, uh, and interpretations. Mm. So, for instance, I think if you take the uh, if you take the pavilion, it essentially consists of one extruded aluminum profile, one protruded uh, fiberglass profile, and one uh, uh, sort of um, a Douglas pine uh, a board, mm. um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, and the way that it's put together, when you go there, you can see it as as a, as a giant matrix uh, of a sort of a, a see-through grid, you can see it as a, as a sort of a, I don't know, Viking ship turned upside down, a cathedral, a, a glacial cave, a, a mountain slope, a, a rock side, like all these different things. And as you walk around, there'll be all kinds of moments where you can, you know, like walking around, just like looking at it the, uh, yesterday, it has all these surprises that I actually think it is kind of beautiful when a very, very simple, focused point of departure can unfold this entire universe of, uh, uh, of different possibilities and also different, uh, different ways of enjoying the, the pavilion. So in that sense, uh, I actually disagree that it's, that it's oversimplified. It might be possible to uh, explain it very clearly, but the result is actually very, very complex. Yeah, it's like a complex dynamic system which develops, you know, feedback loops. And it was kind of interesting, I mean, already yesterday, just the first reactions, and they're going to be, of course, mm -hmm. so many more, you know. Some people talked about the climbing wall. Some people talked about the mountain. They saw it from far away. You know, some people, of course, you know, talk about all the things, you know, you mentioned the cathedral as well. You know, and in a way, it depends very much on the perspective. And I think the idea also that, uh, I mean, the story Julia evoked, you know, with this taxi driver, um, it is really, you know, it created a life-changing experience. This taxi driver told me that his, 
11-year-old daughter, you know, dragged him into this, uh, and the family into this Sergas Kano pavilion. He said never ever would he agree to visit an art exhibition he's against, and never <laughs> ever would he go to an architecture exhibition. But you know, it was free admission, and it was colorful, and before he noticed it, the, the daughter brought him in. And he said it's extraordinary, because the daughter basically ever since in the last six, eight months, Every day we talk about nothing else. He's convinced he's going to become an architect, you know. And that's kind of this idea that there are no thresholds and that people can experience it. That's a very, very big difference. I mean, you decide you visit an architecture exhibition or that you visit the building. Because many, many of our visitors, they actually stumble upon chance and see one of these many perspectives. They all of a sudden see a mountain or see a climbing wall or see a cathedral. And then they go inside. And once they're inside, it's again something very different. Mm. Well, one of the things that's very fascinating to me is the word pyramid has never been associated with the pavilion. And really, mm. above all, the first word I would use is pyramid. Because yeah. although the incredible sort of historic um, onion shapes that make me think of uh, Istanbul, the extrusions are about pyramids. Mm. And I mean, what greater structure mm. on the Absolutely. planet to aspire to? Yeah. So, bravo again. I, th I think at this, this is a good moment for us to pause and take a break. And um, thank you so much, Bianca. It was yes. really fascinating. And I've learned a lot listening to you. Um, it's great. Thank you.